The new Renault 9, car of the year, 1982. A new milestone in economy. The 1.4 manual versions give 52.3 miles per gallon at 56 miles per hour. A new concept in comfort. Five models have revolutionary seats that give more freedom in the front, more legroom in the back. Drive any of the eight models in the range and discover why the new Renault 9 was voted car of the year, 1982. Fifty years of Mars goodness, and now we bring you the biggest Mars bar ever. Even more milk, more glucose, more sugar, and more thick, thick chocolate in a bar that's bigger than ever before. Tremendous value, really satisfying. The biggest Mars bar ever. It looks innocent enough, but past it carries the worms which infest your cattle and sheep. System X controls the total worm burden in the animal, immatures, adults and eggs. System X kills the worms other wormers leave behind. Remember, System X, the big kill wormer. Sportac strikes down major serial diseases, mildew, eye spot, septoria, rhincosporium, and net blotch as effectively as this. Sportac, the answer from FBC to major serial diseases. Flywo electric cultivators, powerful, quiet, easy to use with optional attachments. Available at garden discount shops and Ely Garden Machinery. If you live near any of these towns, then you can listen to the sounds of independent local radio, broadcasting from Ipswich, Luton and Bedford, Southend and Chelmsford, and Peterborough. Independent local radio brings you the widest variety of programmes, reflecting life in the eastern counties. There's the best in news, sport and music. So tune in to your local station for the sounds of the eastern counties. For the very latest news, for the very latest holiday information, page the Oracle. Oracle is ITV's very own information service, all at the touch of a button. For the very latest information, page the Oracle. Now the regional weather with Michael Hunt. Good afternoon. Now the touch of frost in places over our region last night, but the main feature overnight and this morning, of course, was the very thick and widespread fog. In fact, it affected most parts of the British Isles, unusually widespread for early March. The fog has largely cleared away in all inland areas, but is still persisting in some coastal and near coastal areas. And where the fog has cleared, the sun is beginning to break through, and inland areas, it'll be reasonably warm this afternoon, not as warm as yesterday, around about 13 degrees centigrade, 55, uh, with a reasonably fine day, but cooler and with the mist or fog persisting in the coastal areas. During this evening and tonight, it's going to be fine, but the winds are going to remain light and the skies will be at least partially clear, so fog and mist are going to form again quite early in the evening or night and also a touch of frost. Then the further outlook during, shall we say, till the middle of the week or up till about Thursday. Basically, we're going to have dry weather continuing. But also, it will be rather on the cold side. There will be a risk of frost at night. And also, there, when the winds are light and skies are clear, mist and fog again are a feature of the weather. Let's have a look at our chart. And here's the picture. Here's the Atlantic chart. As you can see, nothing way in the way of isobars over the British Isles, hence the light winds, one of the main factors for the fog. This high pressure will move north or northeastward and become established over the northern parts of Britain by about midweek. And there will be low pressure areas moving down this way into the uh, eastern Europe. May bring just a little few showers 
uh, over some parts of Eastern Europe, but I think the amounts are likely to be quite small. And also there'll be a tendency for some low pressure areas to move into France. But overall, mainly dry weather. Let's have a look at the, what the chart might look like, say, uh, sometime on Wednesday morning. This, is, of course, is just an approximation. We can't say that there's going to be a uh, particular weather front in those uh, positions. But you can see high pressure becoming established. These weather fronts coming down the North Sea, and perhaps the end of one of these uh, weather fronts could give a little bit of rain, a uh, uh, sort of 20% chance in the eastern Britain. But the amount's generally small, and these uh, depressions down here only affecting France. So overall, then, right up to Thursday, uh, mainly dry, but also rather cool with frost at night. So the main picture, then we recap, thick uh, mist and fog forming quite early tonight, and with just a touch of frost, being rather persistent tomorrow, but then clearing away except in the coastal districts, and then a reasonably sunny day. The uh, general outlook for the next few days continuing like that, a dry, reasonable sunshine, but also rather cold with, at times, especially with frost at night. That's all from me, Farming Diary, coming up. <laughs> A hundred thousand French farmers gathered this week in the Place de la Nation in Paris. It was one of the biggest demonstrations the city had ever seen. More on that in a moment. In part two, we have the latest installment of the row between machinery manufacturers and dealers over grey imports from Europe. But first, that demo in Paris, which coincided this week with the 25th birthday of the common market. Instead of celebrations, there was acrimony over French farm prices and apathy from Britain, where most people seem to think they'd be better off out of the market. So far as this year's farm prices are concerned, the Commission has proposed a rise of about 9%, but the French minister, Madame Cresson, has made it pretty clear that she won't settle for less than 16%. And in case she was tempted to compromise, the main French farmers' union organised that huge rally in Paris to remind her how they felt. They claim, and their minister supports them, that their incomes have declined for the last eight years. And one feature of the present discontent in France is that it now includes the hitherto prosperous farmers of the Paris Basin. This week, Oliver Walston went to the fertile region northeast of the city to hear about their problems. The vast and almost treeless region of northern France between Soissons and Lens always sends shivers down my spine. There's something eerie about the landscape, and one can't help remembering the slaughter in both world wars, which has left cemeteries littering the countryside, reminding us of things we'd rather forget. The mist was lifting slowly as we approached our destination, the farm of Hervé de Vrint. Although the fields of Picardy are supposed, in the song at least, to be blooming with roses, we found them brown and soggy after weeks of rain. In the 50 miles from Paris, I didn't see a single tractor, as field work was impossible in these conditions. Monsieur de Vrint's farm was situated on a high ridge called the Chemin des Dames. With the land dropping away steeply on both sides, I could see why this spot had been such an important position during the First World War. In fact, the front line remained here for nearly four years, as both the French and the Germans took and retook the hill only to be driven back again with enormous casualties. The weather cleared up as it does so often in March, and I was pleased to see that in this totally arable area, the farm had livestock. I was shown round by Hervé de Vrint, who, with his father, runs the 1,500-acre operation. They have 150 head of cattle, almost all of which are Charolais, but some mongrel breeds were in a pen at the end of the feedlot. A new feature. Yeah. Of, um we used to have only Charolais, and uh, now, I mean, they are about, uh, they are here since about a week. Yes. And uh, so the first one, which are not white in the farm. Now, what are you feeding them on? You've got here beet pulp? Yeah. Uh, it's a mixture uh, of sugar beet pulp, mm. which has been pressed. Yes. And uh, with uh, cereals. Yeah. With... Uh, ure either urea or alfalfa pellets or rapeseed that's pellets. That's what we call lucerne. Lucerne, lucerne that's right. 
uh, or rate seat pellets or soybean pellets according to the price. Of and do you mix meat. this yourself or do you buy it from a merchant already mixed? No, we mix them. You mix them. The cattle are sold fat at around 700 kilos and prices today seem to allow Hervé to make a bob or two. But the main farm business is arable, which in this part of the world means sugar beet and wheat. The yard was full of tackle with no less than 13 tractors, all of which were fierce. Monsieur de Vrient employs 15 men, which at first glance seems a lot, but they have a considerable acreage of forestry. And while we were there, they were planting poplars and walnuts in some of the more inaccessible parts of the farm. The farm used to distill its own alcohol from sugar beet, but the distillery has now closed down and the beet goes to the local sugar factory instead. Yields of beet average 50 tons per hectare, 20 tons per acre. Wheat is the other main crop. They do grow a bit of barley and may grow more when they stop growing looser next year. But I was surprised to learn why they won't be growing any oilseed rape. We don't in the moment because of uh, disease problems. Disease of rape or disease of the cereals after the rape? <coughs> no, of the sugar beet after the rape because of nematodes. Rape puts nematodes into the soil which then affect the sugar beet. No, but it? we are growing sugar beet every yes. two years about. You're allowed so to grow sugar beet yes. every two years? Yes, we're allowed to. And we've been doing it so for quite a long time. So the trouble is uh, the nematode number is increasing all the time. And if you put uh, wheat between two sugar beets, uh, it's more or less all right. If you put rapeseed between, it's also a plant which is stimulating the nematode increase number. I wonder what the British Sugar Corporation would say to that. But I was here to talk politics and to find out whether French farmers were unhappy and why. In particular, were they satisfied with the Brussels offer of a 9% price increase? No. I mean, what's the inflation rate in France? I don't know. What is the inflation rate? <laughs> I mean, it's 15%, so you can, you can see the difference. Would you, are you saying then that you need at least 15% increase in price? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the cost of our product is going to increase of about 15 percent. It's and probably it's going to be 16 percent with the kind of uh, of uh, policy we have. I mean, mm. so there is a difference of six or seven percent for maintaining our results. It has to be filled by productivity. Do you think that <laughs> we can fill with productivity uh, at the six percent level? Do you consider that Madame Cresson, to whom we have been talking in France, is doing a good job representing the farmers or a bad job? We still don't know what, what kind of job she's doing because, in fact, uh, up to now she has been speaking, speaking a lot, and uh, has been a bit aggressive. Uh, but, say, it was only uh, speak, and uh, we are waiting for some... When you say she's been aggressive, you mean aggressive towards farmers or aggressive for farmers, on behalf of farmers? No, aggressive towards first some farmers. I mean, the farmers which I can, the kind of farming which I consider as economic, the kind of farming you find in England, and uh, also against farming union, mainly, namely the FNSEA, which is. Uh, say, the equivalent of your NFU. She has been aggressive towards the farmers' union? Yes, I mean, she does refuse to discuss with them. <laughs> she has refused to talk to the farmers' union? Oh, of course, she, she will not say, I refuse to speak with you. You know, all this uh, uh, chatting about yes. uh, we want to discuss, uh, and the more, the, the more she says she wants to discuss, the, the less she does, you know. It sounds as if you are not very impressed by Madame Cresson. Say, I'm waiting. I'm waiting up to now. I mean, uh, with uh, what she told, what she said, I'm not impressed. But if she acts differently than what she said, and in a more constructive way, I'll agree. But Hervé was doing more than just waiting. At 10 to 7 the next morning, I met him outside the town hall of a nearby village. 
Together with 55 other farmers, he'd hired a coach to take them to Paris for what was billed as the biggest farmer's demonstration ever seen in France. All over the country that morning, cars, buses and even special trains were bringing farmers into the capital. Inside the coach, the population density was nearing saturation point, but the atmosphere, however crowded, was as cheerful as a kindergarten outing to the seaside. It was clear that everyone was looking forward to the fray. The leader of the French Farmers' Union, the FNSEA, had promised 100,000 at the demonstration, so this would be more than the usual march by a few unhappy peasants. Indeed, none of the people I spoke to in the bus had ever been on a demo before. I wondered why a prosperous arable farmer like Hervé was making the trip. I think the basic one is quite, uh, is quite obvious. I mean, it's so obvious. I don't know if it's necessary to speak about it. I mean, it's just the need for, let's say, better support from the East. And also, and it's a French concern in that case, is we need also support from people who are supposed to defend our interests. You're talking Namely about Mrs. The, Cresson. Yeah, Mrs. Cresson. And uh, we have to fight and to, to show really that we are, that we need her support. The early morning coffee, not to mention a nip or two of Calvados, began to take effect as we stopped a delay by to stretch our legs. The organizers took the opportunity to hand out badges and detailed instructions, showing everyone where to meet and what time to start the march itself. It was evident that the FNSEA were very concerned to keep troublemakers out of the march, and they were going to great lengths to ensure that everything went smoothly. Back in the bus, we were on our last leg to Paris, but the traffic was light and we were making good time. The Place de la Nation sounded as if war had broken out again, and it took a few minutes to get used to the sound of fireworks, bird scarers, and other assorted explosions. After a bit, it became clear that the noise was the result of good humor rather than anger, although I was still far from convinced that things would not turn ugly. I asked Hervé if he thought the temperature would rise and we would witness a full-scale riot. Oh, it's the beginning. It's like any party, I suppose. Uh, it's a bit cold. But uh, the subject, subject is too serious, I think, for things to stay cold and it's going to be warmer, I think, think so. in a short time. We, we've just seen a procession with a banner which said, Down with Mrs. Thatcher. Yes. Is there a lot of anti-English feeling here? I think so. I think so. Yes, Why? Oh, because I don't know if the British farmers' interests are against the French farmers' interests. One thing is sure, that, that your government is expressing opposite interests that the one we try to defend. Does this mean French farmers would be happy if we left the common market? In a few words, I think it's right. Yes. There's no doubt that Hervé was right. The banners spoke for themselves. This one, for instance, says, out with the English, down with Thatcher. And this one, who will win, Thatcher or our Joan of Arc? Other people I spoke to agreed with Hervé when he said, they would be happy to see us leave the EEC. It's all rather depressing for an English farmer. Anglophobia apart, the whole theme of the demonstration echoed Madame Cresson's desire for a 16% increase in prices. And everywhere I looked, banners repeated this demand. It was hard to see why farmers and their minister disagreed, but judging from all the uncomplimentary posters depicting Madame Cresson, there isn't a lot of love lost. Whether she'll be moved by their arguments remains to be seen. 
but I don't see how she can fail to be impressed by their sheer numbers. But this demonstration isn't just about prices. There is another reason. The FNSEA, this organization here, which is the equivalent of the NFU and represents about 80% of French farmers, has got these people together to protest against the fact that the Minister of Agriculture, Madame Cresson, has taken in as, as part of her advisory panel a group of other smaller farmer organizations. There's one protecting the family farm, there's another peasant organization, there's one actually that has links with the Communist Party. And instead of the FNSEA being the exclusive voice of French farmers in, in government circles, they now have an equal voice, but only an equal voice, with these much smaller groups. And therefore, it's wounded pride, or what the French would call amour propre, which makes these people come together here today. And come together they did, from all over France. It was like a geography lesson, as wine growers from Burgundy followed dairymen from Normandy. Sheep farmers from the Massif Central led the sugar beet growers from Picardy we had travelled with on the bus that morning as they all set off on a four-mile march through the streets of Paris to the old abattoirs on the outskirts, where Monsieur Guillaume, the leader of the FNSEA, was due to address the crowd. I've no doubt at all that it made a great impression on the French Ministry of Agriculture at the Rue de Varennes. It had gone off without a hitch, and I was struck by the total absence of any violence or even bad temper. All in all, it must be counted as a success, but I couldn't help wondering if it could ever happen in England. Oliver Walston in Paris, and by the way, next week's farm demonstration will be in Brussels on Tuesday, and about 100 NFU marchers will be going over to join in. In part two, grey machinery imports. That's in a couple of minutes. The horse has always been a help to farmers. Harvest here at Triplo has been held up by the weather recently, but it, before that it was going pretty well. We've done about half the barley and rather more than half the rape, and the yields have been very encouraging indeed. The big question mark, of course, is what's going to happen to this wheat, which is still a month away from harvest, and we're wondering what effect the ear diseases will have on yield. And when it comes to wheat yields, of course our ideas are very different than they were five years ago. Three tons an acre we don't consider at all special, and even four tons an acre is quite feasible. And the reason this is possible is due very largely to a group of men who work just five miles down the road from here. I'm speaking about the Plant Breeding Institute, and in particular, the wheat breeders, led by John Bingham. Some measure of their impact can be seen from the fact that as recently as 1970, only 8% of the wheat grown in the UK came from the Plant Breeding Institute. Those with long memories will remember Maris Widgeon and Ranger. Then, in 1972, Maris Huntsman appeared on the scene, and wheat growing would never be the same again. PBI wheats moved up towards half of the national crop. By the end of the 70s, Huntsman alone took a 40% share. This year, PBI varieties command an estimated 80% of the wheat acreage, a tenfold increase over the decade. Avalon with 30% is by far the most popular, followed by Norman with 17%, Brigand with 10%, Huntsman still holding 6%, and Bounty fading fast with 5%. The rest is divided between the up-and-coming varieties like Longbow and others like Hobbit on the way out. Altogether, there are nine PBI varieties on the approved list, compared to two in 1970. The Plant Breeding Institute sits on the southern edge of Cambridge in the suburb of Trumpington. Maris Lane, which gave its name to so many prefixes ranging from Maris Piper Potatoes to Maris Kestrel Kale, is the actual location. Funded by the government, 
Through the Agricultural Research Council, the Institute employs 280 people and occupies 410 acres of the surrounding countryside. The checkerboard effect, produced by thousands of tiny plots, makes it hard to miss as you leave Cambridge on the London Road. About one-fifth of the Institute's work is devoted to wheat, and I began my visit at a spot which would appeal to any farmer. One of the most interesting parts of the PBI is what they call the living pedigree plots, but which, to a layman like me, is really a wheat museum. And I'm standing here almost as if I've landed in a time capsule back 10 or 12 years to the point when I started farming. And here is Capel, the wheat we were all growing then. Behind me are the wheats my father used to grow, like Squarehead Masters, Little Joss, and Rivet. And in the front, the short, modern wheats that we're all growing today. Now, one of the things that stands out most is, of course, the difference in height. Here we've got Yeoman, which is very nearly double the height of Virtue over there in the front row, which is the shortest wheat available today. Another thing, of course, that strikes me is how all the old wheats are now flat on the ground in spite of the fact they've had a medium input of nitrogen and at least a fungicide. But it was not just the antique varieties which had suffered most. Good old Capel was flatter than any other and obviously had been quite unable to stand up to the recent storms. Blue and red cables, looking like a giant cat's cradle, connected the different plots, showing the complex relationships. I asked John Bingham, to explain their significance. Well, in effect, this is a living pedigree, so you can trace back through the, the, uh, the strains to the ancestors of the varieties at the beginning of this century. And in the case of Avalon, the blue string uh, represents the derivation of the quality. So it came from Maris Widgeon, which was released in 1964, back to Holfast in 1935, through to Yeoman in 1916, and Red Fife, which, of course, was a Canadian spring wheat uh, grown at the end of the last century. And the, also shows the other parent for, from which the high yielding came from, uh, uh, going back originally to Broek, which was a high yielding biscuit wheat grown at the beginning of this century. But how do you know which of these parents to select when you're, when you're, when you're confronted with this vast array? Uh, well, I think this is where the long-term experience of the breeder really comes in. Uh, generally speaking, if you looking for high yield, you would have to deal with some of the modern varieties. It's very difficult to bring in yield from the older varieties. But you can bring in particular characters, uh, like resistance to yellow rust, which we are attempting to do from some of the old ones. Well, let's just talk about yield for a moment. You've got red fife right at the back there. What's the difference in yield between red fife there and Avalon here? Uh, well, red fife is perhaps not the best wheat to choose for this, uh, this discussion because it is a Canadian spring wheat that was not adapted to our climate at all. But if you took Broek, the difference in yield would be about 50% between the old and the new. Um, I'm, I'm talking in terms of material that has no disease and which lodging is, is controlled. It, that would be the actual difference in the potential yield of the varieties grown under the same situation. John, as the father of Maris Huntsman, you're really the, the yield man par excellence, and yet now you're talking more in terms of quality. Well, I I think you ought to remember that at this institute we've always put a very considerable effort into quality wheats. And if you go back over the years, as I mentioned before, we had Yeoman, Holfast, Widgeon, and now Avalon. So the wheats have always been available, but they've been rather lower yielding than the high yielding wheats in general, and farmers haven't grown. But that's all very well, but your feed wheats have been so good and yielded so much more, it hasn't been worth our while growing quality. But there's, a, there's a big change now in the production of wheat that you have to take into account. If you go back to the early 1950s, we were producing 2 million tonnes of wheat a year, a year or thereabouts, which was pretty insignificant in relation to our total use. Whereas now we're producing over 8 million tonnes, which is about 90% of what we use, and we produce a surplus of uh, feed wheat. But are you saying that the gap between quality and feed wheat in terms of yield will narrow? Uh, at the present time, I would think the gap is a bit smaller than it has been in the past, but I think they, you, there will be times when the gap will be greater. You will generally expect to find feed wheats perhaps 5 or 10 percent, percent higher yielding than quality wheats. But unfortunately, the premium paid 
is not five or ten percent, it's one or two or three percent. Uh, yes, but I think you have to look at it in another way. In producing the good bread making wheat, you're producing something which the country needs. So you ought to look at it as a different crop. Do you want to attempt to breed the quality, to grow the quality wheat, or are you going to let the French do it for us? So are you saying to farmers, never mind the profit, be patriotic and save imports? I think it's quite wrong to compare quality wheats as a crop with feed wheats. You should be looking at it as, say, in competition perhaps with barley or rape or something else. Are it's the an extra crop that you can grow. So the message is loud and clear. The country needs quality wheats, the PBI has the varieties, and farmers have a duty to grow them. I only hope that John Bingham and his colleagues convince the millers, because without their premiums, it's not going to be easy. John Bingham is also keen that farmers should think of wheat not as a single crop, but as separate varieties, which should all be grown differently according to their individual needs. It's this philosophy which pervades much of the Institute's work. Brigand here. And Norman. That looks lovely. When was this drilled? Uh, this was sown on the 9th of September. John Blackman, who's Bingham's right-hand man, took me to see the trials he was doing with both winter and spring varieties. What sort of nitrogen have you given them? Um, the whole trial has had 190 units. That's an enormous amount. And uh, full fungicides? And a full fungicide program, yes. Well, we're trying to op uh, maximize the yield at any sowing date, so we don't want... He drilled in early and late September, mid-December and mid-March. I asked him what his objective was in this experiment. Um, well, we're more interested in uh, varietal differences here, and we have found that some varieties are far more suitable for sowing early uh, than others. And well, for example, Norman. Late. When Norman, should we drill Norman? Norman seems to require relatively early sowing uh, to achieve its full potential uh, in September rather than October. Um, Avalon? Avalon is perhaps uh, the opposite to this. Uh, sown very early, uh, it, it doesn't do particularly well relative to Norman, but sown late, it will often out-yield it. What are you going to do to publicize the fact that the two varieties, Avalon and Norman, that are probably the biggest single varieties in, in, in this country, should actually be sown at very different dates? Well, this is the second year of this trial, and at the end of this year, we hope to be able to publish these results and give farmers like yourselves uh, some guidance as to which varieties to sell on different dates. So getting the drilling date right is clearly crucial, but that's only the beginning. When it came to looking after quality wheats, John Bingham, unlike so many experts, had some very clear opinions. Well, I think you've got to take a good bit more care of the crop. Uh, the first thing is that to meet the standards which are required for a premium on protein, you'll have to apply more nitrogen than you would, would for the, the optimum for yield, probably about um, 50 to 60 kilograms a hectare more. That's the first thing. You'll certainly have to look after it better at harvest. You'll have to harvest it as soon as possible in order to avoid sprouting in the air as much as, as, much as you can. And uh, then you really need to classify the different crops according to protein content and Hagberg before they're bulked which in my view is where the, um, the co-ops really come into their own. What about late nitrogen, which everyone always says produces quality? Uh, I think the view over the last few years has changed somewhat. And generally speaking now, I think we and ADAS and farmers and their experience would say it's the total amount of nitrogen that you use rather than uh, applying some of it late. But it was not only quality winter wheats which were exciting the men from Maris Lane. At the other end of the wheat museum, there were some unfamiliar looking bearded varieties, which turned out to be spring wheats. Some were so new that they only had numbers rather than names. But how serious were the PBI about spring wheats? Well, uh, the proportion of the work that we actually put into spring wheat breeding is about the about 25% uh, of the total on wheat. But nobody grows spring wheat in this country. Uh, the reason for this is that we think spring wheat has a special position that it could fill that farmers at the present time are not making the best use of. What is that special uh, position? Firstly, as a quality wheat. You, uh, you can undoubtedly get better bread-making quality from the spring wheats than you can from the winter varieties at the moment. So this could go some way to replacing some of the Canadian wheats. Uh, the other is a rotational point. Um, where you're growing sugar beet or potatoes, they're often they're late harvested and it's not a very good entry for winter wheat, but it, it, it is an ideal entry for, for spring wheat. What proportion of the wheat acreage in this country is spring wheat today? Uh, I think about 3%. Now, now if that was 8 or 10%, that would go a long way to 
uh, providing the, the, the better bread making wheats that we need. You must be pretty keen to spend 25% of your effort on 3% of the acreage. Uh, I, I would think we ought to feel at the moment we, uh, we have to see an, I an increase in the area grown to spring wheat. The, we now have some good varieties. We have a 70615, which is an NIB high flyer. There are one or two others around. And it's, I think it's now up to the farmers. If we can stimulate a bit of interest in um, spring wheats, maybe they will take off in the way that winter barley did. Well, I've found that in a dry spring, you can come very badly unstuck. Are these drought resistant? Uh, well, perhaps this is because you've sown your spring wheats at the conventional time in March. Perhaps you should be considering sowing them in, in November, December. Now, the system that I like that I've seen is where you have a... Uh, when, as you plough the beet, you have one of these following combined plough, press and drill and uh, drilling there immediately on the plough. My view is that's one way to get a good result in that difficult situation. Hang on a minute. I think you're having your cake and eating it. You can't call it spring wheat if you're going to uh, drill it in November. Uh, it's uh, scientifically a spring wheat in that it doesn't have a cold requirement. But uh, the, the other experiment that you saw with John Blackman, that one of the main objectives behind that was to see what is the best time actually to sow the spring varieties. What sort of yield would you expect to get out of a quality spring wheat like this? Well, compared with a winter wheat? Well, compared with anything. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I don't think you can ask the actual yield. I think you've got to make the comparison. I would guess that it's going to be 20% lower than the, uh, the winter wheat. I wouldn't be too happy in accepting this yield loss unless the costs of growing were a lot less and the price a bit higher than for feed varieties. But with all that money and time invested in spring wheats, we should be hearing a lot more about them in the next few years. I'll be interested... Plant breeding needs patience and dedication more than most professions because much of the early work involves delicate and fiddly manipulation of individual plants. Mr. Sen, who comes from Peking, is working at the PBI for a two-year stint. The day I was there, he was emasculating wheat by removing the male anthers. Wheat is, of course, self-fertile, and in order to ensure that it is pollinated only by the plant which the breeder has selected, it must be protected in a polythene bag. The resulting seeds from this year are known as F1, and they themselves are planted out in the field to produce the next generation called F2. I went with John Blackman to a field where some of the staff were inspecting the individual F2 plants and tagging the ones which seem promising. With one and a half million plants in this plot, it isn't surprising that this job alone takes five people six weeks to complete. Well, this is the F2 generation. When we start our first selection, we have here about 500 crosses, each sown in a long row, and we select them on an individual plant basis. So people, the people we see here are actually looking at each individual ear? Uh, every single plant. They're quite widely spaced, so we can identify single plants. We've established an artificial disease epidemic. We have a yellow rust spreader here, and the disease has spread onto some of these rows. We can see here a susceptible plant, uh, which we've obviously avoided. And that yellow rust on that That is leaf. yellow rust. Does that mean they have not put a blue tag on that plant because it is susceptible to rust? That's right. Uh, we are also selecting for any other diseases present, mildew, septoria, and brown rust. Now, having walked down these rows and attached blue labels to the plants which appear to be resistant, what's the next stage? Um, well, we perhaps go through again later on if we get a further disease epidemic. Uh, say brown rust builds up, we will go through and reselect some of these. Uh, and then we take a single ear uh, at harvest to grow on to the next stage. So that ear there with the blue tag will be pulled by hand. That's right. And thrashed by hand. Yes. And kept separate. And sewn as uh, a row about a meter long in the following generation. You say it's F2. How many years will it be before that ear of wheat is available on the market for a farmer at C2? Uh, in winter wheat, approximately 10. So we're looking at a variety which will only be available in 10 years' time. That's right. With a gestation period from the breeder's first cross to the farmer's drill of 12 years, a lot of work goes into the creation of a single wheat variety. Much of the early work takes place in glasshouses, and John Bingham showed me a bit of what went on. 
I asked him how he could possibly predict farmers' needs in 12 years' time. Uh, this, is, I think, is part of the problem with breeding, what the breeder has to attempt to foresee. But uh, there's little doubt that you'll always be looking for higher yields and a better combination of yield with disease resistance and bread-making quality. Well, when you talk about disease resistance, how can you know what diseases will be present in 12 years' time? I think you c we know which diseases will be present, unless we're caught out with, with some, some new disease. Which Have you ever been caught out? Uh, well, I think the septoria triticae last year was a bit of a shock. Um, but uh, we were fortunate in that it didn't affect every variety, and there, is good so there are good sources of resistance to Septoria triticae. No, the main problem is that you don't actually know what races there will be, say, of a uh, yellow rust in 10 years' time. Looking back, are there any varieties that you're not keen on now, but that you were keen on at the time? Uh, well, of course, some varieties have given us more pleasure, I might say, than others. I think uh, Huntsman we, we've obviously enjoyed being associated with. Huntsman really put you on the map, did it? Uh, I would like to think that it put um, higher agronomy methods in, in farming for, for wheat on the map as well. I think that was the, it, I think it was the, when farmers first realised that you could uh, get a three tonne crop of wheat in this country that things really began to move. When were you first aware that Huntsman was a breakthrough in wheat? Uh, I don't know about a breakthrough. I can remember quite clearly in F4 when it was, uh, the rows of Huntsman were clearly better than the controls, which of course that was Capel at that time. F4, again, was how many years before we all got Huntsman on the farm? Uh, that would have been eight years later. But I, there, there was quite a bit of good fortune with, with Huntsman in that the year that it came out, which I think was 1972, it was a very bad year for um, Septorium nodorum. And, of course, Capel was rather bad on Septorium nodorum. So Huntsman had, in its first year, a, a very good year, and the farmers took to it quite quickly. Mary's Huntsman had started the revolution a decade ago. And I wondered if John Bingham could keep up the momentum of recent years. How was it physically possible to push the wheat plant even harder? Well, the first thing to look for is the type of change that's already occurred, which is the wheat putting more of its effort into the grain and less into the vegetative parts. So that would be a, an increase in harvest index. What's but harvest index before you go any further? Harvest index, I think we would define as the weight of the grain as a proportion of the total weight of the crop, that is the grain plus the straw. And what would the index be today in, in your best wheat? Uh, the index in the semi-dwarf varieties now is typically about 50, whereas in Capel it was in the range of about 40 to 45. And um, that is, in fact, one of the main reasons why we work with the semi-dwarfing genes, because it does give you an, an increase in harvest index. So after all your breeding programs, you've got to a stage where half the weight of the plant is in the grain? Uh, yes. Uh, there must be a limit how far we could go. Our physiologists would think it was in the order of 55 to 60 percent. Uh, certainly when we get to that sort of proportion, we shall have to look for an increase in uh, total growth. Uh, and it should be possible to do this in the wheat, so I think. But uh, even more exciting is perhaps the, the uh, possibility with triticales, where undoubtedly with the triticales already, we have a t higher total growth, a higher total biomass than we have in the wheat. And perhaps in the long term, if you could put up the harvest index of the triticales, which perhaps now is rather low, it would give you some long-term possibility of increasing yield. So you can see a day when 60% of the weight, as much as 60, will be grain? I would think that 60% would be the absolute maximum. You, see, you, you must have the leaf to carry out the photosynthesis, and you must have the straw to, to carry the leaves on, in the ear. The genetic engineers at the PBI have been working with dwarfing genes for many years now. They've even succeeded in introducing two of these genes into a single plant to create a wheat which was shorter than I had believed possible. In practical terms, this was, of course, much too short, but it did show what could be done to alter the physical characteristics of a plant. But with the wheat harvest at home getting very near, I wanted to get back to farming realities. Was there a secret of successful wheat growing? And more specifically, did John Bingham think it necessary for farmers to follow a detailed blueprint? I think actually aiming for a particular pattern is not necessary. I think the secrets really are to use the right amount of nitrogen at the, the right stage to make sure that the uh, soil conditions are ideal in structural terms as far as you can. And as far as you have any control over it, make sure that the water supply is, uh, is not limiting by pans and so forth. And then leave the variety to, to do its own thing, which we've said before it's very capable of doing. So are you saying that the people who count everything to a fairly well are being a little unnecessarily precise? I think we've got obsessive in that way, some, some people have. Looking to the future, 
can you sort of look into a crystal ball and guess what wheat growing is going to be like in 10, 15 years' time? Um, no more, I think, than you can as a farmer. But uh, I can be certain that it's still possible to improve variety yields. There doesn't seem to be an immediate ceiling on it. I think you ought to be able to continue to improve varietal yields by about 1% uh, a year. A 1% yield increase every year means, roughly speaking, 10 million pounds in farmers' pockets. And when you set that against the roughly quarter of a million pounds the PBI spends on wheat breeding, it's not a bad return. Mind you, if John Bingham's predictions about yields are going to come true, then this field should prove it. Because I'm standing in the middle of PBI's newest wheat called Avocet, which should be released this autumn. It looks pretty promising. One other thing it's interesting to speculate about is whether I really will be growing lots of spring wheat and triticale in 10 years' time. Right now, I'm pretty doubtful, but I'd be happy to be convinced. Goodbye. <laughs>